Disruptors and curious minds, CEOs, professionals, founders, book lovers. Welcome to the Thinking on Paper book club. I'm Mark, this is Jeremy, and this is where we explore the frameworks, strategies, secrets, insights of books that we think will change how you lead, how you think, how you make decisions, how you work, rest and play. Um, this week, we're on part four of Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, founder of Farnham Street. You probably know him, Mr. Mental Models himself. Um, nearly 100 pages, the bulk of the book, part four. Um, might need Chunky. two parts. Chunky. Might, might need two parts for this book, book club. So just, so part one, two and three outline how to think clearer. Part four is about using that clear thinking to make decisions. He kind of outlines four stages of the decision making process, defining the problem, exploring possible solutions, evaluating those options, and then executing on the best one. I think we'll try to break down each section bit by bit. But before that, Jeremy, part four, what are your overriding initial thoughts? So contrary to popular belief, folks, we can't just like smash books into our brain like this and they get in our brain uh, we have to read them, but more importantly, we have to talk about them and smash ideas together. We smash our ideas after we read the book. Mark and I, hopefully you guys are getting a lot out of this and hopefully you guys will join us in one of these at some point. But yeah, chapter four. So uh, Shane Parrish, I believe is a Canadian gentleman. Yeah. Uh, and um, we are- I don't know what, what, What's that got to do with, with decision-making? I will tell you because there's another nod to the prog rock geniuses of Rush uh, in the beginning of this chapter with the quote, if you choose not to decide, you still have made a choice. Another great song by um, uh, or a great lyric by their drummer. But yeah, it's it's really interesting. So decisions, man, we are bombarded with decisions every single day. Right. Um, when do I get up? What do I eat? What do I wear? What, how should I respond to what my kid says? You know, what do I need to say on this call? Bam, 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 bam. And um, there's actually like something called decision fatigue. And I've felt it yeah. before. I've felt like, you know, after a long day and my kid's asking me, hey, can I go over to Max's house? And they're having people over and I'm just like, dude, I am so worn out of making a decision. Um, but you want to, you know, you want to be present for for those decisions too. But anyway, this is a great, great peek into maybe some ways that we can, be more efficient with our decision making. And I found that like the, the rules and automation side of this can be equally applied that we talked about last week yeah. because rules are easier to, uh, to, to, to deal with than making a decision, making a choice when you're in that halt mode, hungry, angry. Uh, what is the other one? Something entire. Um, yeah. So th those are my, those are my initial, those are my initial thoughts so that, that, that the automation, the, the, the importing of rules into this is, is really important as well. Yeah. Safeguards. He calls them safeguards, yep. firewalls to, to help you with the process. Um, well, before we get into part one, just a quote, when the stakes are low inaction hurts you more than speed. Sometimes it's better just to make a choice and not spend time deliberately deliberating. Why waste time evaluating if an action is inconsequential and it, its effects are easily reversed? But when the stakes are higher, though, speed can hurt you. So on that note, part one of part four, define the problems. Let's start there. So Man, so this, yeah, this, this, this roped me into a, a really interesting, you know, mindset because... Um, he says in the book, we're taught to solve problems, not define them. And it made me think of a time. And I just wrote about this uh, last week in, in the right to know you newsletter. But, you know, my son Meyer is like for uh, fourth grade right now. And when he was younger, I think it was maybe second grade. I always try to tell them, hey, before you go to school, hey, guys, ask great questions today. Like ask great questions of thing in a way that you're excited to learn the answer. Right. And he said to me before he went to school, he's like, well, dad, you know, the teachers ask the questions, we're just supposed to answer them. And I was like, oh, damn, like, there's a there's a mismatch in, in what's going on, right? So we're taught to solve problems, not define them. Defining the problem is way more important is what I learned in this first part. 
Yeah, you, you you want to get a call from the school, you'll be happy when your your son has been called to the headmaster's office for asking too many questions. Um, yeah, defining the problem starts with identifying two things. One, what you want to achieve, and two, what obstacles stand in the way of getting it. Um, so he outlines two principles to help... Define the problem. Um, well, two separate meaning, one, two separate meetings. Yet. He said too, right? Like, hey, have two separate meetings, one to define the problem and one to solve it. Because what happens is, like, the the value equation is wrong. Like, the the value equation is wrong of what we're because we want to be helpful. Is so if we're a knowledge worker, right? We're paid to make decisions on behalf of a company on strategy, direction, who to hire, all of that stuff, right? So you have this. Um, your value is is rooted in your ability to make a quick decision and be and be decisive. So before you even understand the problem, you're already trying to jump on the solution. And I think that's deeply rooted into like a mismatch of a value equation for ourselves. I'm tr I was trying to think of an example in my life in work, at home, anywhere where we've tried to define a problem and not come up with solutions during the process of defining the problem is like the problem is made of part one part two part three we're trying to solve part one as we're trying to ex define part two and it's all it's all jumbled up and in every job i've ever had i to be honest the idea of somebody walking into an office and saying right we're having half a meeting today we're outlining the problem we're trying to find out what the actual problem is and then tomorrow next week we'll you know we'll bang our heads together to come up with some solutions that's pretty for the most parts of the professional world quite radical no isn't it massively radical because you know there we're you're in that first meeting everyone is already going to their quick heuristics and 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 they're wanting to assert and this isn't bad i'm not criticizing but this is this is rooted this is biological right you know we're we're automatically trying trying to assert ourselves and our knowledge and our um our rules our heuristics right but sometimes yeah. our heuristics are old and they're based yeah. on old information and old experience and um you know do we even have yeah. the right question and then the ego social inertia and emotional defaults he mentioned in the first parts come to the fore so i know that i'll let you talk about the first couple of tips and safeguards he uses to to add on to that to, to define your problems the second is the test of time test whether you're addressing the root cause of a problem rather than merely treating a symptom do this by asking yourself whether it will stand the test of time will this solution or potential solution fix the problem permanently or will the problem return in the future so you know dig down root cause that's how you you know define the real problem and then the other tip this is your right to know you program writing out the problem using writing the whole point of thinking on paper to define the problem yeah that's right in one follow-up question that i had written down here too um that i thought was really good to get to the root of things is what would have to be in place for this problem not to exist that's what a big have to what would have to be in place for this problem not to exist expand on that um so so the way i look at that is like <clears throat> what not just not just be not just uh treating a symptom uh, of something but going to the root cause like what would make what what conditions would be in place for us to not have this particular problem so let's just i'm just riffing this is like straight off the top but like say we have a factory this factory has a machine um this machine uh constantly i don't know cuts people's fingers right and you know little cuts on people's fingers and you're we're always having to kind of bandage them and all and this is like super simple and, and kind of a dumb analogy but um like all right, so our, our, our people on the line are getting injured, their fingers are getting hurt. What would have to be in place for that problem not to exist? It's not, you know, maybe they're interacting with the, the machine wrong, but maybe the machine is wrong, right? Maybe, maybe the machine is actually outdated or something's, you know, something's wrong with that. So, you know, if that machine wasn't there, people wouldn't cut, you know, wouldn't cut their fingers. Obviously, if the machine wasn't there, they wouldn't be able to produce stuff, but maybe they have the wrong machine to start with. So it's a bigger thing than just saying, well, the humans are messing up. You know, what what would have to be there for it not to exist? For, for me, like, a, I, I understood that. I understood this kind of root problem more from a health 
and medical perspective, whereby I know sweeping generalizations, but Western versus Eastern medicine or non-traditional mm -hmm. medicines where you're prescribed medicine treatment that covers up the problem. It doesn't get to the root cause. It temporarily stops the symptoms, but it doesn't get to the root cause of what's causing your fatigue, illness, injury, whatever it might be. Whereas if you really you want to stop it happening again, not flaring up in a few weeks. You have to kind of dig down into the root cause of it. Um, hey, Mark, here's here's some blood pressure medication. Your blood pressure is really high. You know, um, yeah. Forget it. Forget about the fact that you eat cheeseburgers for every meal and ice cream, and you know, you never move and you never run. Now, now, don't get me wrong. Blood blood pressure medicine helps people, right? But, you know, largely this is not gets, medical advice. This is not <laughs> medical advice. Right. But the root cause would be like, well, maybe, you know, are you are you moving your body? Right. Are you getting up? Are you moving your body? Are you putting good things into your body? Right. That the more holistic side of that. And that's like this. He talks about unlocking second level thinking, which is super interesting to me. Yeah. Because um, maybe talk, it's not your diet. Maybe there's, you know, the diet's the obvious one, but then you have to you dig down and like, what if this? What if this? Well, you take this out, you add this in. What happens if you change this? And then you'll find the wreck. Yeah, it's it, it's it's like the it's like the curious five year old that keeps at the ask the question. And I wrote about this this week as well. Ask the question, you know, why is the sky blue? And you give them an answer. They remain unsatisfied, uh, not in an angry way, but in a curiosity driven way. And they say, well, but why, Mark? Well, because of this. Well, but why, Mark? So unlocking second level thinking, he uses a question here that that says, and then what? Which is really cool, right? So you say, okay, well, maybe we need to do this or maybe the problem is this. Okay, Mark, and then what? It's kind of interesting to think about as a way to extend your thinking as opposed to making it you know, super finite. And then what? And then what? Layers and layers of thinking. And then what? Okay, then what? Part two exploring possible solutions once you're clear on the problem it's time to think of possible solutions ways of overcoming the obstacles to get what you want the way to come up with possible solutions is by imagining different possible futures different ways the world could turn out so i love the imagining different possible futures so i, I talked to a class at a school called the new school in atlanta like um i don't know like five or six years ago and i was so impressed with this with this particular female student that that came in and this was a pitch day so they were they had to come up with different ideas right so she uh, uh her pitch was like this uh this media platform that would focus on just good news right so it's kind of like um that what is that one that um david byrne has he's got this um anyway he's focused on good news but anyway what she decided she would do is you know imagine the future as she wanted to see it and then write the news from a perspective that would bring that future to life which is super interesting right yeah. so it's it's thinking okay well what does the future look like if i make this decision this way what does this future look like if i make this decision this way and he's had the three plus um rule i think which is like force yourself to come up with three solutions to the problem right and that's Divergent thinking. Let's point back to Nexus, right? That's divergent thinking. That's the paperclip test. That's, hey, Mark, how many uses of this can you come up with, even if they're super silly? And then of those three, pretend that one gets automatically taken away. What does that do to the other two decisions? Um, so these are really cool rules, really interesting, applicable ways to, to change our thinking. Yeah, I, I like, and that student sounds like like the antithesis, the polar opposite, the antithesis of me. And I liked the, you know, get real, get with reality. We're not getting out of here by Christmas, guys. We are, we are, we are screwed. Um, the stoic, stoicism again, the pre-mortem. And now this, I have a lot of fun with this. I like predicting the worst case scenarios. I yeah. think there's a, a lot of creativity in that. It's fun. Um, yeah, worst cost scenarios. So he he calls it the bad outcome principle. Don't just imagine the ideal future outcome. Imagine the things that could go wrong and how you overcome them if you do. So this is it's a it's a balance. You you know you can't be pessimistic and doom mongering the whole time. It's like oh what if this because you go to a meeting 
And I've had this when I've gone to, yeah, but what if this happens and I suggest something bad? It's like, oh, stop being pessimistic, Mark. Right, right. Um, no, but, but it is, could happen. it is, it is helpful to think about all the different, all the different versions, right? So it's, it's a, what did, what did he call it? Um, instead of a, instead of a, oh, here it is. Instead of a predictive mindset, it's a preparation mindset. Yeah, yeah. So you're preparing for all the possible outcomes. So when that funky one comes, you're like, oh, well, we have a little contingency for that if, if that happens, right? Yeah. It's um, easy to react to something you've prepared for rather than in the heat of the moment, trying to dig your way out of a situation that's pressurized and stressful than you've had no preparation for. Yes. And uh, so, so, how, so here's, here's a question too. And, and I have his answer to this one, but I always like putting you on the spot. Mark, like, how do you evaluate possible solutions? Like, what are do you have a like a a mechanic that when you have to make a decision, do you say, "Well, I have to"? It has to hit X, Y, or Z, or how do you evaluate decisions? No, that's why I'm reading Clear Thinking by Shane Parrish, so I can get some more of those. Strategies. Okay, yeah. Well, so so Shane, so he lists like you know, okay, uh, ROI is one. That's easy, right? Uh, opportunity cost is another one, and then the third one he has is the likelihood of desired outcome. So well, I think that's for me the one was mostly that he mentioned as a as a time not money so at the moment in my life a lot of it comes back to how is this going to give me time or take away my time mm -hmm. so, and then i try to balance that with is this interesting am i going to learn something i'm talking about my job here which is like, i yep. write about emerging tech and culture so am yep. i going to learn something is it relevant to me in my future uh, am i going to get paid and but reading this i'm not I'm nowhere near specific enough. I need to get down and specific with the numbers. However, you're measuring those. Um, um, what, what does he call them? Those um, definitions, then I need to be more precise. Yeah, there, I mean, they're really I mean, there are really some interesting takeaways in this to to try. Um, and, you know, there were some from last week as well. And I think there, there's probably going to be some in any every one of these chapters. Um, so let's let's talk about this analogy that 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 I ran across that I thought was really interesting, um, or just this discussion. And this weaves through all the different parts. I think is you know real knowledge is earned and abstractions are borrowed, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, so here's here's the analogy he uses is you know are you a chef or are you a line cook? So I worked in kitchens for a really long time and I I really understand this analogy, right? So a line cook can produce can execute recipes very efficiently very accurately uh you know under high pressure in the middle of dinner service like they're very good at, at executing something that is is already put together but a chef understands the science of how a sauce comes together and how the fat works to cream up a sauce or how a type of protein how the fat in a protein breaks down to give that protein flavor and keep it tender and all of that kind of stuff so are are you a are you a chef or are you a line cook? And I think I think that's really interesting to think about. Well, some people aren't even line cooks; they're delivering vegetables into the kitchen, chopping up the, their bloody potato chopper. Um, yeah, I like that. It, it's like you know when you walk into a restaurant and you have a really nice dinner, and you're like, "Where's the chef? I want to ask the chef what's the secret." And the chef is like, "What's the secret? Twenty years. That's what the secret is." Harder um, knowledge, not abstractions. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, and then also, what, what do you think about this? So this was this was encouraging, right? Because, you know, knowledge is earned that so that doesn't mean we have to like, opt to read the 3000 page research study with academic jargon versus like the five page article, right? But what we have to do, I think, no matter what we read, we have to imprint our perspective on the information we're taking in, right? So the way I look at it, and he calls it designing your own abstractions, which I think is awesome. Like in, in Right to Know You, we talk about this through a process called synthesis, which is like connecting all of these different, different objects with your perspective, you know, putting your stamp on it and saying, okay, well, that information is now applied to my experience and my knowledge. So design your own abstractions. How do you, how do you think about that? design my own i'm very good at designing my own abstraction abstractions <laughs> um well i think this ties into when he's speaking about um the hi-fi principle i think he calls it and if you you know speaking to people at the source or as close to the source as 
is possible. I'm not talking about the source in the kitchen. I'm talking about the source of the information. If you have a problem and you're the CEO, you're the manager, and you're speaking to somebody who's on the coalface, you're going to get much more relevant, pertinent, powerful information than you are if you're speaking to somebody via somebody else who who, speak, who got the source from somebody. You know. So it's like this, the clarity of the information, the high definition information comes from the people closest to the source. And maybe there's a link there between the quality of your information and the quality of the people that you're getting your information from. Was was that the story about the planes and the mosquito nets? Was that yeah. in this chapter? I yeah. thought that was really cool, right? Because we were like, well, man, why why are these pilots not wanting to fly? Well, the pilots aren't flying because the mechanics aren't fixing the stuff. Well, they have all the parts. Why aren't they fixing the stuff? And then the guys went on the front lines and like, man, when they fix these planes, it's the middle of the night. It's when mosquitoes are are high and mighty and, and the lights are on and they're getting pummeled. So they're not out there doing it. And they're like, well, hey. Get some mosquito nets and amazingly the planes got fixed the pilots had confidence and um so that's a prime example of that right general stockard or something but he didn't go himself did he delegated which is something right. else we spoke about delegating i mean i thought he was going to go but he didn't um just maybe it's gone forward a bit too far opportunity costs speak to me about opportunity costs he, he's big on those Oh, just in general. I, I mean, that's that's kind of a methodology for for predicting future or, or imagining future outcomes. Right. So if I make this choice, what am I missing? Right. Yeah. Um, and I think that's that's a piece of the pie. Right. And, and I'm in the same boat, too. It's a time time and money equation. Right. You know, I've got I've got four kids and you know, you've got a couple of kids and, um, you know, having having money to for the for the essentials is great. But like having the time is really important too. So, you know, if you take something that is going to give you a little bit more money, it might take away some of that time and, you know, you have to evaluate what that opportunity cost is. That's how yeah. I look at that. Mm -hmm. I, I was never taught about opportunity costs and it's something that I'm trying to pass on to my kids more about, you know, what we lose and it, but if you're looking at it from a professional, from a, a brand, I don't know if you're, you're launching this app, what do you miss out by, by not launching this app? If you hire this person, what do you miss out on by not hiring that person? And that kind of, addition by subtraction but being aware of what you're missing by by missing out um anything else that you want to add about what did evaluating? you waiting what do you think about perspective weaving did that jump out at you while you were reading this at all perspective weaving like seeing things from other perspectives yeah i think he, he ended up calling it perspective i think perspective weaving but if you imagine you know, there, there are 10 different views to a challenge that you're having within a company, right? You know, different, just like, just like the planes, right? So you had the pilots, you had the people fixing the planes, you had um, the, the higher ups hearing about the problems of the planes not working and all of these different perspectives. Um, but if you think about trying on all the glasses, I think that's a really interesting thing to think about where it really puts you in the perspective of someone else. So, hey, what does it look like to see this problem through Mark's lens. Let me put on Mark's glasses, right? And actually like physically thinking about that maybe gets you to pause a second more to, you know, drive a more of an empathetic experience in that instead of just being like, well, Mark thinks this, this and that, he's probably gonna choose this. No, really get into Mark's perspective, put on his glasses. I think that was really cool. Empathy, but even, even if you're not, you know, com going completely empathetic and putting on their glasses and walking in their boots and, putting their socks on everything even that that's in your mind will give you pause for thought and any time that you're pausing for thought then that it, again if if the, the he calls it you know a a lap as long leaving the solution as long as possible if you have the time anytime you pause for thought then you're giving yourself a wider perspective aren't you well then you look at it from that you know consequential consequential versus reversible kind of seesaw right as you evaluate it you know so do you you know if if it's if it's not very consequential and it's reversible then you should make your decision super fast right and just be like hey i'm not going to deliberate on this you know it's it's inconsequential and it's reversible we're going to do this right oh look at that we're seeing graphics there, asap there. versus a lap there's the picture yep. on the page yeah with reversible more or less along the x-axis and consequential there, more or less up on the y yeah 
Yeah, there's so many there's so many little takeaways in here to to help with one of the bigger problems I think we have as as people as business owners as people that work for other people just as people in society we make so we have to make so many decisions. So how can we how can we put things in place to make that process simple? And if we looked at just consequential versus re in reversible or re reversible, right? Those that's a really interesting thing to think about. Like the next time you make a decision, you know, don't deliberate on it if it if if you can go if you can go back like the mattress thing I think was yeah. interesting you know people deliberate and freak out over mattresses right so you're like all right am I going to choose the right one or what's going to happen and then you just go well maybe I just choose a company that has a great return policy and I get a mattress here I lay on it if it doesn't work I send it back right yeah um yeah. life is easy Mark life is easy right well I think this goes back to a quote from last week where life can be easy and this is what happens when you spend too much time thinking about the things that don't matter and not enough time and energy thinking on the things that do matter and you know you spend a day choosing what mattress you get you know when you can just send it back and swap it you know make make the make the the defaults uh, work in your favor not against you um so yeah frameworks safeguards automate automations personal automations um they're all part of it and the four steps define the problem explore possible solutions evaluate those options execute on it um let's talk about let's talk about integrative thinking really quick did you did it. you get pulled into that at all integrate see i don't remember that combination of words I love that we I love that we have so our glasses are different as we're reading this book and it's and it's cool because you make me think about things that I don't think about and I, and vice versa. So integrative thinking is is this idea of like I think Einstein used to call it like combinatory play, right? Like where you're bringing these things together and and kind of smashing unlike things together. Um, but the way I think about integrative thinking is when I was running my company Tune Welders. Uh, we were making you know, music for, let's say, a brand or an advertising spot or something. And we would uh, create 10 demos. Let's just say like 10. Hey, we get all the creative direction. Here are 10 demos. Take a listen. And instead of forcing them into picking one of those demos, what we used to say is, hey, listen to these demos individually for things that you really like about within that specific demo that's tied to what you want your brand to sound like. And then we would basically stitch together the parts that they liked from all of those demos and create something net new. It took a little bit more work, but it always ended up in the in a really cool result. So take that to decision making. So you're making a decision or you've defined the problem. And you're like, all right, here are three or four ways that, that I can solve this problem. Instead of making it one of those four ways, you can combine those four things into 16 other things that could be different permutations of that one decision so it doesn't have to be binary it doesn't have to be like all right well i have to choose one of these three things it could be a little bit of you know solution one a little bit of solution two a little bit of solution three to create something net new so i think that's that that was cool was that when he was talking about having the the breaks in position so you know that you can spend too much time on the problems and then you get to a point where you just beating yourself up because you just repeat going over the same ground um and by defining what's the most important to you you can save a lot of time on that because when you say that i mean a i hope you got paid for all 10 demos not just oh, yeah. I mean, like, there's a oh, lot yeah. of work going on there yep. but are you yep. not i don't i'm not sure how i feel about that creatively whereby you create these things, you take it to someone else, they say, okay, I like this bit, this bit, this bit, and this bit, and then essentially mutating your work into something else that isn't what you, anything that you first came up with. Um, well, the, mu the music the music for me, when someone's paying me, when a brand's paying me to write music, it's not, it's not necessarily my music, yeah, okay. right? It's their music. They're using me to, uh, they're hiring me to use my expertise to create something for them. So it's their song, it's not my song. So I gotta figure out ways to get them to their song. Got it, okay, so you're not, it's not yours, so there's no problem changing it to. Yeah, so the loop you talk about is really interesting too, because there is a point where you have, and this is different, I think, than the integrative thinking approach. This is when it's time to make the decision. If you start 
if there's no new information that's coming up and you're looping in this old information, right? And the same stuff kind of keeps coming up after a while. You're like, hey, nothing new is going to come up. This is the information that I have. This is what I know. And it's kind of time to make that decision or you end up in opportunity cost land, right? Yeah. Fail safes, margins of safety. I like margins of safety. Do you consider margins of safety in your decision making process, Jeremy? Man, I wish I did more <laughs> intent, more intently. Um, yeah, I, I think the margins of safety kind of gets gets back to imagining various versions of the future and then the likelihood yes. of those versions of the future uh, oh. coming together. The, the fail safes were really interesting um, and the Ulysses version of the fail safe. Hey, we're going by the sirens. I want to hear the song, but I'm going to plug your ears with earwax marks so you don't steer the ship into the shore. Tie my ass to the mast. The more I the more I try to convince you to turn the ship, tie me to the mast tighter. You know, those are interesting fail safes. Uh, and I think it's called the Ulysses Pact, I think is what he referred to as that. Yeah, make, make it ex outside forces stopping you from making the wrong decisions and uh, there was one last kind of analogy that i really liked and it was bullets before cannonballs yep um when essentially analogy of you're at war two ships on the ocean you're under attack you've got a limited supply of dynamite you put it all into a big ball and you fire it at the ship and you miss it's a big but bet it's a big bet but if you use a little bit of gunpowder fire a little bullet miss the boat readjust the sights target the middle miss again a little bit more and then when you know the angle to shoot at you pile all the gunpowder in you blow the other ship up and i, I, I like this analogy of incremental variation of your decision making i like that i think yeah and it, it aligns with the kind of a methodology i have for i call it pilots to products and if you're able to like if you think something's out there that that is interesting and that could potentially be something that someone would want to purchase, how could you test that in its smallest form and then make sure you get good information on the outside of that test? It's de-risked. You put a put a wall around it and you go, okay, I did this. It turned out to be that. And then you feed that back into, you know, as you move from from bullets to cannons. And I yeah, I think I think that's a great analogy. Awesome. All these principles will help you get what you want but not help you want what matters. That's a big one. I, I really enjoyed that last sentence of the book and look forward to getting into this, getting into this fifth, fifth part. And, you know, again, prior to popular belief, we can't cram this stuff into our head. Um, would love you to read Shane's book. I think it's amazing. But if you don't want to read his book, listen to us talk about it. Yeah. And book club, we're in the third book. Uh, if you want to go on YouTube or thinking on paper to X, Y, Z, you can catch up on the Nexus the, the convergence of art, technology, and science, the design of everyday things. We read that eight parts. There's a lot of us talking about design and a lot of us talking about Nexus thinking. Next week is the last part of Clear Thinking, so we'll announce the next book in Book Club. Then. Stay tuned. This is my pick this time. Yeah, it's going to be whatever it is. It's going to be a banger. Um, and that's about it. Check out the show on Thinking on Paper. Subscribe, like, share. Tell your friends. Tell your book lover friends. Um, that's about it, Jeremy. Anything you'd like to add? Hey, be curious, interruptive. <laughs> Keep thinking on paper.